Good evening, everyone. Special welcome to all the live uh, audience members, as well as those of you that are attending uh, via Zoom tonight. So I am Superintendent Craig Stenman. My far left right is Joan Hinkle. She is a paraprofessional for us and is also serving as our school nurse. Um, and I'm also a member of our OPS COVID-19 team. Uh, right beside her is Carrie Haugen. Carrie is my administrative assistant and is on the COVID-19 team and is also uh, the primary contact for COVID-19. So when we're having communication for, you know, with the uh, Department of Health or Dickey County Health Department, they'll be uh, directly uh, communicating with Carrie. To my left is future Dr. Sell, the elementary principal and member of the COVID-19 team. And to my far left is Principal Brandon Veda, uh, also a member of the team. So before we get started and go through and answer your questions, um, I want to tell you that the, the draft that is out there is truly a draft. Tomorrow at 7 a.m., the school board is, is meeting and will review, and make modifications if they so choose, and then approve the plan. Even though the plan is approved, though, I think everyone needs to realize it's fluid. Everything that we're doing may change. You know, we're in meetings with the health department um, or Dickey County Health. And at the end of the meeting, we say, just remember, everything we just covered may be outdated tomorrow. As a matter of fact, it may be outdated tonight. And so our, our plan we know is going to have to mold and move uh, as we do the best we can and adjust to new information coming out. I also want to mention um, when we started this, is we agreed that we're going to try to keep what a reasonably prudent school district would do at the forefront of our decisions as we're working on this plan. We sought guidance from North Dakota DPI, from the North Dakota. Catholic Health Initiatives, from our Dickey County Health Department, from our Dickey County Health Officer, um, and also guidance from the Center for Disease Control. As we were starting to plan, we gathered information and data from parents and staff surveys, and that data helped guide the decision when we were starting this. And I think that covers the Intro. So we are going to start with questions and we'll probably rotate between questions here that you have as well as questions that we get on Zoom. So who wants to start? So the difficult part uh, to answer your question or your question um, was what does social distancing look like in high school? And unfortunately for high school, you don't have the same group that rotates through every single day because both students are taking a variety of core classes, but also it's electives. Those electives sometimes dictate then what section they're in. So there might be with one group of kids. Um, there are two core classes, but then they might have a different mixture of classes or classmates, I should say, the next class they have. So the social distancing is a lot more complicated and difficult in high school than it would be in elementary. Uh, with that being said, you know, in the classroom themselves, we're going to do our best um, to space out students as feasible as possible given the space. To go along with what Brandon said, we are also recommending to our staff that all classrooms have seating assignments and that all desks or tables with the space the same direction in the classroom. And if they can't face the same direction and they're in 
different groups, the pods are expected to be at five more or less and stay in that group within that room. It, interestingly enough, though, our summer plans had the 15 number as the maximum and then six feet distant of all those. And so we've been following that all summer long. The plans for this fall do not have that. It, it changed uh, dramatically and went to social distancing more feasible. Is there any kind of special attention paid to children that are leaving the state for vacation or to visit family when they return back to the school? Is there some kind of process they have to go through? That's a great question. The question is, is there some sort of process that uh, takes place if a student or family leaves the state, such as on vacation or if, and then comes back? And we've talked a lot about that amongst our own uh, group. And we said that we're going to have to follow what the state has for guidelines for travel. So if you remember back in the spring, if, if you went to certain states and traveled, you had to isolate and you came back, those have all been lifted. So North Dakota currently does not have any requirements to travel. So until those plans are changed, that wouldn't happen for us. There are places though that North Dakota is Expected if you're if you're um, going to the state of New York, North Dakota is one of the states that you'd have to isolate for 14 days before they want you to New York. Going that way, but not coming back necessarily. School, um, school districts are allowed to have their own curriculum. What what are the color zones dictated by? We knew this question. <laughs> it's the biggest one we have. Um, the question is, who dictates the colors and, and how does that process work? So for us in K-12, there are um, five colors, blue being the lowest risk, then moving to green and yellow, orange, and then red. So currently, the governor, um, in consultation with North Dakota Department of Health, will make the determination if and when the state or specific county may change colors. Currently, the entire state is in the color green. Um, so the, the decision is based on the governor's office. The question is, if there were a spot in the state that had a lot more cases than our um, location, is it possible, granted, pending that the governor is the one that does that, is it possible that there may be different colors? And I think it's possible, but right now it's all one color. Um, and I think people think that the way that they're doing the colors is by how many active cases there are, but that's not true. Um, the governor is going to make that decision based on all of those metrics. Like if you go online and see on the North Dakota Department of Health, you know, like the cases of their active hospitalization, so forth. He's taking into um, consideration all of those metrics. So you might see that the county only has 10 active cases, but they might all be in a hospital, and so then they might have a different color. So that all these different things will come into account. Is, is the school able to mobilize without the governor's permission? Like say it was, you were gonna get a hotspot and all so close. Are you able to go ahead and make decisions without having to wait for the governor to tell you to do it? Our, our plan, oh, the, the question is, um, would we have the availability to mobilize or go to uh, distant learning on our own if the governor doesn't change the color? Uh, and our plan pending approval tomorrow will be based on the colors. So we're gonna base our information on that color. However, it's the plan is fully approved locally on what we're doing. Um, so realistically, 
I think those two would correlate that if, if we felt the need that we had to transition, I would think the color would naturally be changing. We've talked about that a lot in our meetings that it shouldn't be a surprise to us um, if we start having a number of students or staff or community members that contact COVID-19 that we would anticipate a color change. It couldn't be a shock either way. Carrie, do you have any questions you'd like to answer? So we asked our families to submit questions and responses to our last survey. Um, the first frequently asked question was, what day is school going to start? Because we haven't really talked about what day is school going to start. School pending board approval on our plan will start August 31st. That allows us those three days that we were going to be in session to do training with our staff. There's a lot of stuff we want to learn. And those classes won't, I mean, that won't be time that we will have to make up later on. Those are our three states. Questions. There have been hearing of some schools that are offering kids to go online, but if they choose to go online, they have to continue online for the next So if you choose not to do online um, and something happens that makes them comfortable mid semester, can that family then switch online? The question is, is it stated that some schools in the area are offering a distance only option for their students and they have parameters on when they can and cannot transition in and out of that distance only option. Um, and the question also went into whether or not, let's say, a family chose not to pick the distance option, but partway into the semester, felt uncomfortable, wanted their child to be part of that, could they um, um, volunteer to go into that plan? So we are like other schools in the area. We have a distance only option, which means that our, if a child and family picks that, they will be learning from home. They wouldn't be required to ever really be in the school. If it's K through six, they'll be getting their curriculum through the DRN Southeast uh, Academy. If it's seven through 12, the classes will come from the North Dakota Center for Business Education, which means they're being taught by staff that are not both public school students. As a school district, we're mandated to sign up for those courses and pay for those a semester at a time. And we're going to require that if Families um, have to do it for a semester. So if they pick, they've got to stay in. If they're partway through, um, they'd have to hold out until Christmas to be able to switch. But what I would say is that I would also anticipate that if families become uncomfortable, it, I would think that it may tie to cases. And if our cases are going up, our color may go up. And let's say, for example, that we get to orange, all of our students will be distant learning only. Um, so, and the, those kids that pick to take classes face-to-face -face will be taught by our own staff, but the ones that are distance only would still be distance only with the academy and with the center of business in. Yes? follow-up to that question, what is the cost of the district? Yes, the question is, what is the cost to the district per student for the distant only option? Um, and it's right at about $3,000 per student per year. So 
multiply that number of times however many kids we uh, would have to have done that way, that's what the additional cost will be to us as a district. The caveat is though, we would still receive uh, North Dakota Foundation aid from those students. And so we would still be getting revenue, but there would be substantially, there's gonna be substantially uh, additional expenses incurred with that. Uh, the question is, are we asking families to incur some of those costs, or is it going to be all by the district? Uh, currently, our plan states that the costs will all be borne by the district. Uh, there is language in our plan that states that the students don't pass the classes, then they'll be required to cover the cost for the classes they don't pass. You're welcome. Julian, you want to ask a question? One of the questions was, how often will the colored status be evaluated and communicated? And through the governor, um, where it will be changed, it can change some for us. It will be evaluated some for us. And they will let us know it's not the school that's going to make that decision. Great question and answer. Thank you. Any questions from Zoom? I think I saw Anna move. She has a question. I'm surprised that we haven't gotten this one yet, but um, are facial coverings going to be required? <laughs> um, and according to our plan, I have my old lady glasses on this. In the blue green case, facial coverings are going to be strongly encouraged, but will only be required in certain places. So, like maybe in band and choir, where we can't socially distance and the kids are really close together, they may possibly have to be um, born at that time. Oh, when they're not seeing or they're not playing their instrument. Sit over there. Uh, but then if you go into the yellow, um, they will be required to wear masks when we pass from class to class or on a bus. They're going to have to wear masks. Might have to be determined in the classroom too, you know, because if we have, when we're in yellow, if you look at the plan, we're going to be about half of our kids will be here. They'll either be in group A, they'll be in group B, depending on in the high school or the elementary, how they're going to be divided up. But let's say that we have too many kids that we can't distance, we might have to wear them in the classroom, but we'll just have to determine that when it comes to it. But in blue or green, they will not be required to wear masks except in certain places. You know, like I said. I know that the masks are a big concern for people. So through DD County Health, help me with this. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, she asked what's recess going to be. So the guidance from DD County Health is, it's kind of a, um, a different step because it's outside. So um, the kids are, you know, it's just different how they air and the breathing and what, you know, so the kids are still going to be able to go out to recess. We're probably going to say, um, maybe not like the slide. <laughs> that only happens in the winter, right? When there's ice. Um, but we still will allow the kids to go out to recess and, and play with each other. We might cut it down to two classes together, like K and one, or we might go out to kindergarten, first grade, or second grade. Um, we'll just see how that goes as it gets closer. And the elementary, we've got a little more freedom. You know, we can make adjustments as need be. Are you taking temperatures before they come into school? The question is, are we taking temperatures um, before coming into the school? 
We are not taking temperature before coming into the school, but we are asking that all families uh, go through the checklist that is in the plan and take their child's temperature, as well as staff take uh, their temperature. We talked a, a long time about this and about how we can possibly do that. And we, we did the logistics of 500 students and 75 staff, and we really have three or four entrances where people come in. And if we were going to have, make everyone line up and take the temperature, it takes five to 10 seconds for each one of those. Uh, we calculated that it'd be 83 minutes of, of temp taking and really a struggle to keep them socially distant during while they're waiting in line, number one. Also, you know, as the weather changes, how, how we keep them outside. And so we went with the option of asking everyone to, to do it on their own court. However, um, we are, we're going to really emphasize with staff that they know their kids, they know how they normally look, and they sh they're going to be able to tell if they're not feeling well, and they're going to pay close attention to that. And, and I believe we have nearly enough thermometers for almost every classroom um, that they'll be able to have those and then check the temperature of a child or ask that child you know, if they can they look like they're not feeling well or they say they're not feeling well. We're going to rely heavily on our parents to be the front line of defense in all honesty. If your kid isn't feeling well, just keep your kid home. If our staff isn't feeling well, we're going to encourage them to not. We have purchased enough thermometers for every classroom, and 85% of high school classrooms, we have some staff members that were comfortable doing it. What we have to remember as we go through that process is that is a very vital piece of information, but it's also a very private piece of information. We have to be very cognizant as a district about not sharing that information with anyone. It's a FERPA violation. That's, that's a huge piece for us. If we take a temperature and we record it, that becomes a medical record. So that's something that we have to be very conscientious about how we deal with those kinds of things. We have also purchased our staff for every classroom in both buildings, um, gloves, face masks, gallon jugs, hand sanitizer with pumps on, thermometers, for the office staff and whoever is going to go into our medical room that we have already established. Those were recommendations that came to us through the health departments and CHI and um, health and center. What do we need for this room? I need to know what it needs to look like. Those were the recommendations. Okay, we have quite a few questions on the Zoom right now, and they all pretty much pertain to or pertain to math. So um, the first one is: Is there consideration for a mask to be worn during hallway transitions, even in the blue and green zone? Our blue and green zone states that we strongly encourage uh, students and staff to wear masks, but they are not required. Um, in the blue and green zone. I would also say that we had a very lengthy discussion as of COVID-19 on wearing masks all of the time in the yellow zone. Uh, we had lots of discussion on both sides of that. We voted and it was 7-7. Seven, seven. So we chose because of the tie, we did not mandate masks at yellow and the school board will be discussing that tomorrow and we will know our vote and we'll have to be making a decision on that, but we know it's going to be challenging to get very different views on that. Okay. Any special arrangements for thought ed activities, math? So 
in the elementary, um, giving the kids space should not be a problem. Uh, I don't know if you had kids in here when we had our past science teachers, we had something called squat spots. And the kids would be have their own space all around the gym. This entire gym is available for quiet. And I'm sure there will be modifications in um, activities that they do, but there we should be able to keep our space, you know, pretty well without a mask. I say the exact same thing for the high school. Um, seventh and eighth graders, we just separated. There's one day I think where we they overlap for 20 minutes, but we have enough space in those gyms to separate the kids out and keep them in a game where they're usually not all together in one group, breathing on one another. So being active and quiet. And as far as 10 to 12 graders, that's usually a smaller amount of students that take quiet after the requirement. So it's not a large number of students. So we should be able to spread them quite nicely uh, in, in both gyms. Next question. Whose responsibility will it be to provide and properly monitor masks? Will face shields be considered an acceptable alternate to that? The, the piece on who will be required to um, take care and monitor the masks is that we're encouraging students and staff to take care of their own masks. We do have disposable masks that we can provide, but we're not mandating they wear ours. Um, and what was the second part? Will face shields be considered an acceptable alternate? What we will do is we will allow any of the uh, face coverings that are approved by the CDC. So the short answer is yes, face coverings will be um, allowed and approved uh, as long as they're okay by the CDC. That's the center for disease control. Next one. In the blue green zone with busing, how will the staggered seat seating or sitting with family members or classmates be enforced? Will bus seats be taped off the hill? And would the school be willing to require face masks for busing in the blue and green zone? Well, we're in the blue and green zone for busing. Uh, we don't intend to mark off the seats we have feasibly we have too many students and we don't have enough bus drivers nor buses to be able to do that and so our push is going to be to have required uh, seating arrangements on all of our buses and to try to keep the groups familiar as much as we can um, we have not um, agreed on wearing masks in the blue or green for busing uh, but have or if we're in yellow. And of course, if we're in orange or red, there wouldn't be busing because we would be distant learning only. Um, another, if you look at the North Dakota High School Activities Association, we work on the application piece. There are several recommendations or guidelines from them. And one of the things they ask for busing to is if it's feasible, try to have as many windows open as you can for air movements. Will we be informed when there is a positive case within the school and where the positive case is? For example, the elementary or the junior high or the high school? This is another great question. We as a school will not be informing people who have cases. Obviously, that's a verbal violation. We cannot be telling them um, any of that. So families will find out if they're in close contact or, um, and that, that will come directly from the health department or Dickey County Health. So that communication will only come from the health department. It will not come from us as a school. Have you decided to cut down on the um, movement between classes for six? Or are they still gonna move to each? Oh, um, the question was if they're going to stick smoothly, they are not playing our schedule. In blue and green, we will still be the same. They'll still be rotating. Um, we probably will stagger our trips down to the locker rooms 
Um, and probably keep some of the same grouping. So let's say they go from Mr. Shaw's class to Mr. Warren's, they would probably stay with the same pod. We're going to try to do that to the best of our ability. Now with yellow, it'll be half of the kids. And we're probably, I mean, at that time we talked about the teacher going from class to class, and we'll have to make some accommodations for that too. So it'll be this, they'll be split in half, and those, that'll be who they'll stay with instead of, you know, before they were in certain reading groups, they could be in a different group than that. Nope, they'll still, blue and green, we're going to still run our schedule just like we do, kind of like the high school, you know, they're going to go from class to class. So, yeah. Question for Zoom. Will a student who chooses distance learning be able to participate on extracurricular activities? Absolutely. The law in North Dakota is that homeschool kids, distant learning kids, and all the kids that are in school can um, participate in sports. That is the law. Being we're in a pandemic, I'm assuming that that school that was created is not going to be in effect this year because if you quarantine for 14 days and you're out of school, that essentially will defeat the purpose of that um, particular policy. The question was basically our attendance falls to the 10 day have to slim it per semester for you to continue that in pandemic. And the question um, is a good one. Uh, no, we will be suspending that. We're not going to have as many kids as possible or under doctor get a note with symptoms or quarantining. So um, that will be suspended and it will just be monitored on a case by case basis as far as attendance purposes. Um, obviously, if you're not feeling well and you have symptoms, you want to stay home and, and recover and get better if you're sick. A high school student could come to school for a band if they choose the online distance learning only for the semester. That would be for an activity they would have to be participating in regional large group music and an activity that goes further than um, just playing as a class for academics, if that makes sense. So an activity would be um, starring music or vocal choir and stuff where you're going to compete. If you're going for just the academic class, you're not going to compete, and that would not be considered an activity. When there is a positive case in a classroom and the classmates are deemed close contacts, what does the learning change look like for elementary students? That's going to be a very good question because we won't know. <laughs> because we won't be able to communicate. We might not even know. For, we won't know until the Department of Health contacts us. So it could end up being that that one child in a pod, we just don't know. You know, the Department of Health might say the whole class. We might say the elementary. It, it, we just don't know until some, a case like that happens and then we're just going to have to be flexible and figure that out. So how, because a, a 
that refer to it as is deemed close contact, they'll have to be at home, which we discussed. Uh, how quickly is the staff ready to mobilize learning? The next day. That's part of the whole reason why we're having these three days before school. And one of the things demanded by the governor and the Department of Public Instruction is that we are able to transition um, from one color to the next at the drop of a hat. That's the requirement that we have this year. And so we should be able to mobilize right away. That will be part of the teacher's plans. If somebody does end up getting quarantined, do they then go to the distant learning program for that 14 days or are they just out of school for 14 days? How does that work? Great question. The question is if um, somebody is quarantined for 14 days, do they have to then do the online distance only option or, or what does that look like? And for the high school, central and elementary, it'd be no different than if a kid was sick or on a vacation or something that they'd still receive their education either through online resources or we'd have to figure out a way to deliver those resources with understanding that they're quarantining. So we have to figure out a plan on a case-by-case -case basis, but they would not have to go into the distance only option because we'd want them to come back once they will. But we really felt there would be a difference between if the kiddos sit, they're not gonna feel like doing what they, you know, their homework, but if they're just quarantined, we're probably gonna be delivering um, class over electronic things you know, so that they, they can join in and be part of it um, if they're just sitting at home having to be quarantined. Will students be taking their devices home each evening? Referring to the elementary. We had this discussion and um, we will have further discussions, but that was the plan that they would be taking their devices home. I'm not sure about KN1, you know, we'll have to just see where we're at and what color we're in, but the plan was that they would be bringing those devices home. It would be expected that they come back because if that night we find out we're going into yellow, we're going into orange, then we've got to be able to transition that next day. With, with all the parents taking temperatures in the morning before school, uh, you're probably going to have a lot more phone calls in the morning. Is there a preferred way to, if the phones are busy and we have to keep our kid home, how can we get a hold of you? That's a great question. The question is, with everybody taking their temperatures at home and more phone calls coming to the office, is there a preferred method of communication? If you call the office, there's somebody in the office from um, 645. The office opens at 645 with someone to answer the phone. If no one answers the phone, those voicemails all go to me, which I am able to access online even if I'm not at my desk. So even if you don't get to talk to a person, there's no option for that. We have an email. We have an email. An attendance email set up. I don't know what that attendance email is because to be honest with you, I've never used it. But I know it's on our website. You can click on this box and send an email to and that goes to the office staff also. <laughs> the address is ops.attendance at k12.nd.us. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Dana, I think you have a question. Please. So, another question that we've asked was why can't parents be allowed into the school if they were screened for wearing? And uh, you know, parents are allowed in the school, but they must remain in the central office area. And you know, that's a requirement to reduce the possible spread uh, to students and staff. Um, we're still having a discussion as far as how to organize what open house and the first day of school would like. More information will come on that. To piggyback off that, we are also not allowing vendors, any outside staff, basically other than the mailman and the delivery people, and their contact is to their things outside the office also. We have noticed in the last month 
that even our delivery guys are wearing masks. I know that not letting parents into the school is going to be the hardest on my K1 too. Um, not necessarily in the high school, you know, but I know that it's going to be hard. Um, it's going to be an adjustment, but it's for the safety of people coming in, our kids, our staff. So um, the doors are going to be remain locked in our school, except for the central office doors. And at 810, Every morning there will be a greeter at the door and parents will be able to drop their kids off in either the flagpole door or the door that's south of the, um, on the south wing. Mr. Dovitz, Mrs. Kelly, um, that, that door, seven, five, five and seven, I don't remember the door numbers. Um, so parents will stop and they can come up to the doors and drop their kids off. And then after school, they're just gonna have to wait outside in their cars, you know, um, during the weather when it's nice, we can stand out there, but we'll be bringing the kids to the door and we're probably going to be staggering it. So kindergarten will probably be leaving earlier than first grade, first grade, second grade, so that not all of the kids are coming out in a big bunch. And I know it's hard and I'm sorry parents, but it's just, it's just got to be this way that the parents are not going to be allowed in the school building, except for in the central office and they have to stay in there. I would, I would jump in with the high school, so we'll still have the east entrance open for students, but the majority of our students park in the main part of the lot, so the central office is where they're usually entering, anyways. The question is, is our over-the-counter medication policy going to change this year? The answer is yes. Uh, we are going to administer no over-the-counter medication to anyone. We're going to encourage our 7 through 12 green kids who can carry and self-medicate to not carry and self-medicate. That was a recommendation from all healthcare providers that I spoke with as to not gas symptoms. Um, there will be a few exceptions to that. We have a few kids that have migraine issues, and asthma, or a seasonal allergy type thing. But those will be on a case by case basis, and we already know who these kids are. So, no over the counter medications to your kiddos at school this year. Prescription, we will still dispense from the office as we have in the past um, our licensed dispensaries. Final call. Any last question or questions? Well, I'll close by saying it. I'm really appreciative of, of you and I'm appreciative of our staff and COVID team and our families. Everyone's been extremely patient. Uh, we're all going through this together and we know that it's changing and we know that things aren't happening as fast as we want them to happen. We don't have information out as fast as I want it to get out. Uh, and I really appreciate that. And I ask for uh, that patience to continue as we go through this. Please know that you know this school year and all the things we're doing is, is only while we're in the pandemic. We don't plan on this being forever. We just plan on it being during this time. Um, and last but not least, um, remember that everything we talked about tonight may be outdated tomorrow. As a matter of fact, it may be outdated and changing tonight. So thank you. Have a great night. Stay well.